And so what I respect so much about the players is to like step into this arena, which is like not designed for victory. It's an arena that's designed for failure. So welcome. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to another um, Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoja. I'm a psychiatrist practicing in Boston. Ooh, this chat box is big. I'm going to move this over a little bit. Move you over a little bit. There you go. Um, just a reminder that everything we discuss on stream today is intended to be for educational purposes only, and nothing is intended to be taken as medical advice. Um, so if you guys have a question, please go see a licensed professional. Uh, okay. So just a couple of announcements. So for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. K has been out for a couple of weeks. Uh, I had the privilege of accompanying Evil Geniuses to the International, um, which was quite the experience. And today I'm going to share with you guys what that was like. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about just the experience of being a TI and a couple of like important lessons that I learned. And um, we may be talking more about this in depth uh, over the next few weeks. Like we, I'm going to be sharing some of the, the key things and like more applicable stuff about um, kind of performance and, and how to manage confidence and doubt and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, so we'll, we'll hopefully we'll like put that together a little bit. Today, I just wanted to kind of check in with y'all and uh, hang out with chat some. So yeah, couple of other, uh, a couple of other notes. Um, so next week, we're not going to be on a regular stream schedule. We've got, um, we've got another project, super secret project that we're working on at HG, which uh, hopefully we may stream. So I think we're going to be around on Monday for Austin show. And then after that, we're going to be out probably for the rest of the week. And then we'll resume a regular sleep, uh, a streaming schedule starting in November. A um, couple of other things that people are kind of curious about. So um, here at Healthy Gamer, we do a lot of stuff for gamers, but then we also do a lot of stuff for parents of gamers. So, uh, you know, we'll sometimes get requests from parents who are like, hey, my son is like, oh, like they're having problems and, you know, they're not doing things and... Um, you know, like they play too many video games and then they'll be like, they'll, they'll ask us like, Hey, can you like, can I enroll my son in your coaching program? And we'll be like, well, if he wants to come, he's more than welcome to, but you can't enroll him. What you can do is enroll yourself in our parent coaching program. And then they say, well, no, I'm not the one with the problem. My kid is the one with the problem. And that's where we're like, well, we're not so sure we agree with that. So we are actually going to be, um, launching more parent coaching spots on November 11th. So some of that, we may actually try to do like some content uh, around parents. And so be prepared for that. So like we may have some parent and family related questions, people who are in relationships with gamers and things like that. So, um, you know, we're, I, I think it's actually something that we don't really do a whole lot on stream, which is actually a lot of fun. I really enjoy working with parents. I really enjoy helping parents sort of better communicate and understand their kids and also helping like parents work on themselves because a lot of times the the problems that children have will be like related to like parents. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll do a little bit more of that and kind of support, um, you know, parent child relationships in terms of like communicating, but understanding each other and things like that. I need to enroll. Yeah. So good luck with my mom. I need to enroll my wife. Exactly. So that's what we try to do. So I know it's kind of unorthodox. I know it's a little bit un, uh, weird, right? Because like we're healthy gamer, but I do think that um, a big part of what y'all struggle with as ga or what we struggle with as gamers, like it's not just us, right? There's a lot of things in our lives. There are a lot of relationships that we have. Um, sometimes we have toxic influences and like working on that side is like really important too. <clears throat> you can enroll Joe Mama. That's the one exception. Um, Dr. K's Guide to Secret Projects. Okay, so let's start talking about TI. All right, so for those of you that don't know, there is uh, an eSport called Dota 2. And every year they have, or most years anyway, um, they have a major tournament called the International. And the International is the largest eSports prize pool, like basically every year. So this year it was like a $45 million prize pool and you've got 16 to 18 teams, I think, that are competing 
um, every year. And so I had uh, the honor of accompanying Evil Geniuses um, to the International, and we had been working together for uh, actually the whole year, so we'll talk about that in a second. But here's like the first thing. So I've done a lot of work in esports, but I have never accompanied an actual team and like, you know, been with them intensively for such a large tournament. I mean, I guess theoretically it's, you know, TI is the biggest tournament of the year in esports in general. And boy, like the experience is like absolutely wild. So the first thing that like I was very surprised about is I've had, I've been in a lot of like stressful situations. So like there's this slight trigger warning around physical stuff, um, like, like people being sick. But so I remember when I was an intern in residency, we had one code. And if you guys don't know what a code is, a code is like what you guys see on TV when people pull out the paddles and stuff. It's like basically when someone's like, you know, like in kind of some kind of like uh, ventricular fibrillation or something like that. So like their heart isn't working and, um, or their heart stops beating. And then you have to like do chest compressions and stuff. So these are like really stressful things. Like you get, you know, like the, the PA over in the hospital is like code blue, code blue room, whatever. And then there's like a swarm of people that run into the room. And I remember there was this one particular code where there was someone who had uh, a problem with their heart and I was doing like chest compressions and like you know, the, the movies don't show you this, but like a very common thing that happens when people like, or you know, you're doing chest compressions on people is you'll do like, in like you have to cause the heart to beat, right. Or not beat, but you're like squeezing blood out of the heart. That's literally what you're doing. So sometimes like, you know, what they would tell us in residency is it's okay to crack a rib to like save a life. So you have to like push down really hard. The other thing that they don't really tell you is that, um, oftentimes when you're doing ch chest compressions, people will start to vomit. I'm not sure why, but so I remember like very distinctly, probably the most intensive code that I ever had ever been a part of um, was like one where I was doing chest compressions, like the person was like vomiting on me and it was like just awful and disgusting. Very, very high stress. I've been in other stressful situations like, you know, acute suicidality, um, my wife giving birth to kids, like just really high stress stuff. And nothing compare like that doesn't even compare at all to the experience of like being at TI the amount of stress and pressure I'm not even playing and like the amount of stress and pressure that these people deal with like on a daily and hourly basis is absurd like it, it's hard to describe but you can feel like the pressure in the air and I've been in tense situations like I've been in you know boardrooms where people are like arguing and like CEOs are about to get fired and like super awkward stuff, right? Like very challenging things like being yelled at in the emergency room when someone who's like rich and powerful is going to sue you because, you know, their son relapsed again or whatever. Like there've been a lot of stressful situations I've been in, but like TI is just a whole different experience. It is hands down the most stressful experience of my life. And I wasn't even playing. So the first thing that I kind of want to like say is like, it's absurd. So what I would describe the feeling as is anytime that your team is playing, right? So I'm in, in like a separate room with, um, you know, EG's coach and, and we're watching the game. And like when you're watching them play, the other thing that I was kind of surprised about is like TI wasn't fun. I was expecting to have fun. Like I went and, and watched TI live and, and at TI8. So this was like three years ago and it was like a blast. It was like one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life. But being a part of the tournament is just so incredibly nerve wracking. It's like, it's, it's terrible. Like it, the pressure is so bad. So what I would describe it, the closest feeling that I've ever had is I remember a, a couple of weeks ago, one of my kids was um, playing on a trampoline and they fell off the trampoline. And so as a parent, like I'm 15 feet away and I see her like falling and I see her like, you know, cause the trampoline's elevated, right? So she falls off. And then there's this moment where like, as a parent, you're not sure if they're okay or not. You see the fall happen. Time kind of slows down. You run over to the kid. And then like, you know, when they get up and they're, they're like, you know, they're not hurt and nothing's bleeding and or whatever, like you feel this immense amount of relief. It's like this very intense tension where you don't know like, oh my God, did my kid really just hurt themselves or are they okay? And then you run over and then you see them like, and they're fine. And then you get like this relief that washes through you. That whole experience lasts like two seconds. Like literally it lasts like two seconds, right? They fall, you can cross 15 feet like pretty damn quick. And you can see like they, they get up and they're not crying or whatever, right? It's like two to three seconds. Being at TI is like that two to three seconds for like hours at a time. 
Because when you're actually watching a game, like you never know, right? Like someone could throw, someone could like th these people like, because you can see the whole map and like, you know that your players can't. And so you know what the other team is doing. You know, they're like smoke ganking or you know that they're like, like someone's farming under a ward or you, you realize like, oh my God, like the enemy's sneaking Roche. Is the team going to realize it? Or are they going to, are they going to figure it out? Are they not going to figure it out? Like, you know, someone screwed up and they, they spent one of their cooldowns. Like, how are they going to take the fight? Like now's the time that they need to take the fight because the stuff is on cooldown for the enemy team. Like, it's just this constant feeling of like, you don't know what's going to happen. It's like watching, like it, it's, you just don't know. And when you win, like you're not happy. Like that was the other thing that was really, really surprised. Like sometimes people are happy when they win, but you're, most of the time it's not like happy. It's just relief. It's like, there's no, there's no positive emotion. It's just tons and tons of pressure and negative emotion followed by like, oh, thank God we didn't screw it up. Right. And, and so it's like, it's just mind-numbingly stressful. So I, I think that was like really educational for me in terms of, you know, just not wrecking, like the pressure is just overwhelming. So the other thing that I want to say is like the players are absolutely amazing. So these are some of the most resilient individuals I have ever met. And I, I think especially about some of these folks like, because um, they, they do this, Right. Game after game, tournament after tournament, like year after year, they sign themselves up for, you know, you practice for like hours, weeks, months, right? You're playing pubs, you're scrimming, you're, you're, you know, even like doing stuff with Dr. K, like you're doing everything you can. You're talking about the game, you're thinking about the game. And then in a moment, like it could all, like it could be for nothing because you just lose, right? And like, then the game is over. And so what these people do is they like sign up for this experience, like game after game, tournament after tournament, like year after year. I, I think uh, Ice 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 has been to nine TIs and like just the amount of resilience you have to have to go to wake up every day and like do this over and over and over again, when success is not only not guaranteed, it is statistically unlikely, right? Because at the end of the day, 90 players go to TI and five of them win and 85 of them lose. It's the way that the game is designed to be. TI is designed not to make winners, but to make losers. And this is something that I think people, like especially fans, like when you, you know, you criticize and stuff, which we'll get to that in a second. I don't think people really appreciate that this is a game that year after year, these players are signing up for and like loss is almost certain right? It's crazy. You have, you have like a 90% chance of losing. Like that's just what it is. And, and it, it, it's, it's the amount of strength and internal fortitude that it takes to show up and play this game like over and over and over again is like, it's, it's amazing. Like these are some of the most resilient people I've ever played with or I'm not played with, but like worked with. Um, so like what I mean by resilience is if you kind of think about it, like, you know, every time you go to a tournament, like you just don't know what's going to happen. And the amount of like faith that you have to develop in yourself, the amount of uncertainty that you have to deal with, you know, it's just, it's so crushing. And like, you just have to develop such a core of internal strength to like tolerate that. You know, it's, it's kind of hard, but in real life, like chances are you're going to end up okay if you keep trying, right? If you think about like relationships, for example. So sure, like any individual relationship may have a, sh a small amount of chance of like, like working out. But at the end of the day, like most human beings end up in somewhat of healthy, happy relationships. Most human beings end up with some amount of like, you know, success within their career, in their job. Most human beings end up like, you know, if you play a video game, like if you purchase a video game, you're going to like have some fun playing it, right? Like most of normal life is like, is like leans towards success. I know we kind of talk a lot about how people struggle with failure and things like that. But at the end of the day, like most human beings are like doing okay. When you get up and you go to work, there's not like a 90% chance that you're going to be fired at the end of the day, right? When you go out on a date or let's say you're dating someone like 90% of marriages don't end up in divorce, right? So I think it's just really, it's, 
it was very eye-opening to see how incredibly resilient these people are and how much the deck is actually stacked against them because it absolutely is. So the next thing that I kind of want to talk about is that, so I'm going to talk for a second about EG's performance over the year. And I think there's like a lot of lessons to be learned. I learned a lot. So it was a very educational experience to me. And I think it was interesting to see, you know, what principles do I personally try to live by? Do I advocate that sort of apply to TI? What amount of, you know, psychology or like principles of like how to live your life, like apply to TI? And so I think um, the next thing that I want to talk about is just the season as a whole. So I worked with EG over the course of the year, which, you know, a lot of people don't know, um, and I think overall, like I'm, I'm really proud of the team. So I think that the team is super, is understandably like disappointed in their TI performance. And I think people are disappointed in EG and things like that. And I also felt some degree of disappointment, but I think this is like really important in life is that like, you know, if you really look at their season, like they had a good season, right? So they, they made it to, uh, you know, they made it to the grand finals of two majors you can also say, oh, they didn't win a single major, but I think they were number one in the DPC league, which means that if you look at their performance across the year, it was like very, very strong. And this is kind of the problem with TI is that TI is an esport where the only thing that matters is, or Dota is an esport where the only thing that matters is TI. So I'm going to give you guys just how an analogy to illustrate like how bizarre of a situation this actually is. So let's say I'm a surgeon and I'm operating on like the president of the United States or like the prime minister of, you know, my country or whatever. And if like, if that patient dies on the surgery table, like, is that bad? Absolutely. But it doesn't invalidate the thousand lives that I saved before that one experience, right? It's certainly bad and it's certainly important. You can even argue that like that person who's on the table in that moment is more important than people who have come before it. But esports and especially Dota is the one place where it doesn't matter how good of a job you do prior to TI. It just doesn't matter. It's it's an eggs in one like all of your eggs in one basket, like in a, a, to an absurd level. So I think one of the key things that I kind of took away from this experience and what I, I tried to you know help the players understand, which they may not they may not understand, and it may not be an issue of understanding, right? Because it's, this is their life. Um, but I think it's important to be like, okay, at being disappointed in yourself and also like to be able to feel pride at the same time. So, uh, you know, the way that I feel about my TI experience is overwhelmingly, I'm proud of EG. I'm proud of what they've accomplished. And I understand that they're disappointed. I felt some disappointment too, but it's like, it's really important in life to recognize that even when you don't do something that you really wanted to do, or the results that you were shooting for are disappointed that you be able to take pride in like other stuff as well. Because the truth is, is that EG has a lot to be proud of, right? I mean, they, they had, generally speaking, a stellar season. If you look at it by any objective measure, any sort of like truly rational measure, they did fantastic. So they made it to TI, which, you know, let's remember that like a lot of good teams actually didn't make it to TI this year. Um, you know, they had a disappointing performance at TI, sure. But at the end of the day, like they played some really, really awesome Dota. And so I think it's important that like, you know, in life, like it's okay to be disappointed in what you do. It's okay to be like not happy with your performance, but be careful and remember that just because you're not happy or it's okay to be disappointed in like the most recent thing doesn't mean that you don't deserve to feel some amount of pride in like what you've done prior to that day. And, and like I said, I respect these players so much because, you know, a lot of people say that EG sort of has disappointing performances that they kind of, I think if you look at it statistically, maybe LGD or EG um, is the most, uh, is the winningest team in, in maybe the history of Dota. So if you look at like the average placement that EG has had over the last like three or four years, I think they could be number one or number two. So they have very, very consistent results. They play really, really solid Dota year after year, tournament after tournament, and game after game. And at the end of the day, that's not enough, right? Because the Dota is an eSport where the only thing that matters is one tournament. So it's kind of interesting because people will also complain about the prize pool and they'll say like, you know, the prize pool for the majors is like tiny. It's like $500,000 and then like the, the prize pool for TI is $45 million. And you can, you can complain about that if you want to. But let's remember that 
you know, it's it's kind of interesting because it's like it's just an esport that is designed to create tons and tons of losers and like one huge winner. So in when you're faced with those kinds of circumstances, it can be really, really hard to have faith in yourself. It can be really, really hard to persevere. Um, you know, giving up is very easy to do when there's basically one tournament that matters. It also makes it really, really hard to practice throughout the year, right? Because at the end of the day, like who the hell cares if you made it to the grand finals of like two majors in a row. And like, if you guys look at IG's performance, for example, so they won the first major and then I think they got like knocked out pretty early in the second major. And then LGD won the second major and they made it to the grand finals of TI. And then like, you know, the amount of flames and hate that LGD is getting is like astronomical. And so that's just the nature of the beast. And so what I respect so much about the players is to like step into this arena, which is like not designed for victory. It's an arena that's designed for failure. And so that's tough. Um, and it can be very, very hard to be proud and feel some degree of like pride in your accomplishments because you genuinely do have a lot to be proud of. I think EG has a lot to be proud of. I'm very proud of it. Um, but it's hard. And I think, uh, you know, for those of you at home, like I encourage you to think a little bit about that as well. Like it's okay to be disappointed in yourself, but there are things that you can probably still be proud of. And it's very hard to feel that pride, right? It's not easy. It's like, because you're so overwhelmed by the disappointment of the moment that it becomes hard to be objective. So that's kind of, you know, because I, I think the other thing that I'd kind of say is that like, in this way, Dota is like real life, because if you look at it, like, you know, there are a handful of billionaires, right? Those are like the TI winners. And for every billionaire out there, there's like, you know, millions or tens of millions of, of people who, you know, don't have a whole lot of money. And so in life, you can also say that like for every one winner, there's like 10,000 losers. I think for every, you know, one winner, at, you know, for every one team that wins TI, like 18 teams lose TI, and not to mention the 60 some odd teams that are like tier two and like competing in tournaments and like didn't make it to TI and all that kind of stuff, right? So there are tons of teams out there that are, are sort of destined to lose because that's just the nature of the beast. So, you know, it's it's tough, but that's what it is. And I think what what the real testament to strength is and what I really respect EG for is like picking themselves off the mat and like trying again and trying again and trying again. Uh, that doesn't even mention, you know, not even to think a little bit about the toxicity that a lot of the players face, right? So I know that especially like, you know, Reddit and stuff like that, we're going to talk about this in a second. Everyone likes to analyze like what happens at TI. So let's talk about that. So, oh man, there's so much to say. Okay. So I want you guys to think about this for a second, okay? What determines whether a team wins or loses a particular game of Dota, right? Like what goes into it? Like, what do you think actually like goes into it? And the, the really shocking thing is that if you look at these actual games and like, I'll ask y'all, uh, I'm going to assume that you guys know about, you know, what happened at TI and stuff. But if you guys think like if LGD and let's say that LGD and Team Spirit, there's like a thousand alternate universes. What percentage of the time do you think in those in thousand alternate universes, what, what number, like what's the percentage that you guys think Team Spirit would have won? And what's the percentage that you think LGD would have won? Right? So people are saying like 75% LGD, 90% LGD, 50-50, 20% LGD. So here's the, the first thing to understand about like Dota 2 tournaments. Dota 2 tournaments are not designed to have the best team win. And you can definitely argue, I mean, there's there are a lot of good arguments against that, right? Like you could say, well, clearly like the team that has the mindset and whatever, they're the ones that, that win the best. And I'm not saying that the teams that won don't deserve to win. What I'm saying is that the, the tournament is designed for entertainment, not to actually like scientifically assess which team is the most superior. Do you guys get that? Like that's why they have best of ones. So I'm not saying EG is the best team, by the way, and it's not copium. I'm just saying, it, like, you know, in science, when we're trying to find a particular answer, what we'll do is, like, we'll do a randomized control trial with, like, 10,000 subjects so that we can really figure out what is responsible and what isn't. 
So Dota is a, is a game that's designed, or at least tournaments are designed to be spectator sports. And if you think about all of the alternate universes that it exist, what percentage of the time would you guys say that Team Spirit would win? And what percentage of the time would you say that LGD would win? And we're seeing a, a variety of answers. My point is, you know, my point first and foremost is that it's complicated. So one thing I came to understand about Dota 2 is it is way, way, way more complicated than I ever understood. And so, like, I think the biggest thing about Dota is that it uh, it seems very easy to understand when you're watching a game, like, why you lose a game. And if you guys want to understand this, like, you know, have a 2K MMR player like myself analyze a replay, and then, like, you know, we can say, oh, like, you know, this we lost because this person fed. We lost because mid didn't rotate. We lost because of this. And then if you take, like, a 6K MMR player... And then you have them analyze the replay. The answers that they're going to come up with are going to be different from the 2K MMR players. And then if you have a 10K MMR player, like when they analyze a 6K MMR player, like they're going to come up with different answers. And then you have 12K MMR players who are going to come up with even more different answers. And so I think if you look at like, you know, what goes into winning or losing a game of Dota, this is the super fascinating thing about it. Dota is one of these things where hindsight is anything but 2020. So we have this saying, right? We toss around the saying a lot, which I'm going to dispute in a second, that hindsight is 2020. I don't think hindsight is 2020 in Dota. So if you look at, like, if you really talk to, and this is one of the privileges I had, right? So I, I had the option to talk to some of the best Dota players in the world and, like, ask them, why did you win this game or why did you lose this game? And the truth is that, like, it's very hard to tell right? It's like, it's, it's so hard to tell. And, and I know, for example, like I, you know, being able to watch TI with top tier players was also like very, very educational because there are a bunch of people who have, you know, been knocked out who are still really good at the game. And so being able to like, you know, watch games with them and talk to them about who do you think is going to win? And also like, you'll get two, two players that are like both very, very good. And I can ask them the same question based on the draft and like, you know, the skills of the team and things like that. And like, who do you think is going to win is like, it's still like up in the air. So there are so many factors that go into, you know, a game of Dota that it's really, really hard to tell because neither team is going to play perfectly, right? So like, they're not open AI. So, you know, why did you win? There are some games that you should win, which you end up losing and some games that you should lose that you end up winning. And so there are so many things that go into it, the draft, the timings, you know, rotations, the, the macro strategy. Part of what I really love about Dota is that there isn't a right answer when it comes to Dota. It's, it's truly like a clash of ideas and philosophies. So it's really interesting to see, you know, how different teams will play, like their macro strategy and what they believe in. There are going to be like meta heroes and non-meta heroes and things like that, but like it was really interesting. I mean, I, I really loved it because one of the things that I came to understand, which I don't see anyone really talking about, like when I read Dota 2 threads about, you know, why people are winning or losing, is like the high level strategic thinking that goes into the draft. So I, I think like 99% of posts that I've, I've looked at, like don't have a clue how people actually draft and what they draft around. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of people can kind of say like, just ban Magnus against TS. So let me just give you guys an example. So I'm in that camp, by the way, for the record. But l let me give you guys an... Let's, let me ask you a question, okay? So what do you think gives you a greater chance of beating TS? Is it banning Magnus or having a, a, a strategy that successfully counters Magnus? What do y'all think? See, this is the really interesting thing, right? Because if a team has a bedrock, like a foundation, and you have figured out a way to counter that foundation, letting them pick it and then countering it could give you a better option at actually winning the game, right? So, so and this is where, like, if you look at everyone kind of saying, so this is exactly my point. So some people are saying ban it, some people are saying counter it, some people are saying you can't counter it. And so this is like, this question is impossible to answer. So you can have lots of opinions about it. And so like, like this is just the one example of, you know, you'll see like different philosophies. So I think like Secret is a good team that 
tr has faith in itself to be able to counter strategies. And if you kind of think about it, like what they'll do is they'll say like, uh, yeah, so LG did did counter it game three and four. Exactly, right? So, so this is what happens. Like if you're LGD, like in game three, you know what you decide to do is you're like, okay, go ahead and pick Magnus. And then like, you know what they're going to do. You know what their play is going to be. And if you're successful in countering it, you're actually at, a, at an advantage compared to if you just ban it and don't let them play it. Right, you kind of draw them into their strategy that they're comfortable with, and then you smash them because you have the appropriate counter. That's just one example, okay, of like you know one hero where where it's like arguably speaking like a pretty simple sort of thing, like because Collapse is really good at Magnus. But the thing is, when you're really looking at Dota, that's just one example. There's hundreds. There's like over a hundred heroes. There are tons of different players. Do you play your Dota or do you try to counter their Dota? And in that sense, that too, from a drafting perspective, it's like, how do you want to draft? Do you want to draft for your game or do you want to draft to counterpick their game? Do you go first pick or do you go second pick? You know, so many of these different factors come in. And then once again, like, it's not just about the draft, right? Because like, you'll see, um, uh, you know, once you actually get into the game and then like, let's say you drafted what you thought was a good theoretical counter and it doesn't end up succeeding. So then the question is, like, did you not execute it properly because, you know, the player who's, let's say, playing Rubik was rusty and hadn't played Rubik in a while? Like, was your strategy the problem was, was, were, is, or is your execu execution the problem? And that's another example of, like, an impossible question to answer. So Dota is one of these things where the more I learned about the game, I realized that there's, like, a massive amount of, like, Dunning-Kruger going on. Where everyone can look at the last five minutes of the game and say like, oh, they should have, you know, like the carry just got too farmed. It's GG. But how did the carry get farmed? When did the carry get farmed? Why weren't they ganked? Were they ganked? Or, or was it that like, you know, the, the team did a good job of protecting them? Or like, what are all of the reasons that go into it? You know, it, it, so hindsight is anything but 2020. And I would sit there for, you know, hours and hours and hours and talk to dota players about uh, specifically eg right like you know when you guys lose a game or win a game like what are the reasons for your win and what are the reasons for your loss and at the end of the day people can come up with opinions and you have to have faith in those opinions but i think that like it's staggering because there's no gold standard in dota and that's what's really bizarre is that in in the rest of the world like we tend to have objective answers Right? When you take a test, there's an answer key so you can know objectively whether you're right or wrong. Like even in medicine, if I suspect someone has COVID, I can do a test and determine objectively whether I'm right or wrong. In Dota, there's just so much uncertainty. You never know what the right answer is. You just All you have is your judgment. But there's no such thing as an answer key. There's no such thing as a biopsy. Sure, you can watch the replay and you can come up with conclusions. But at the end of the day, hindsight is anything but 2020. And this is also where I think like for those of y'all at home, I think it's really important to understand this principle because I think most human beings will go around believing that hindsight is 2020 when in truth, it's anything but. So I'll give you guys just one example. So I was working with someone who was interested in getting married. And so they were dating this one person for a while and that, you know, the relationship fell apart, dating a second person for a while and the relationship fell apart, third person, fourth person. So they had four sort of serious relationships over the course of, let's say, three or four years. And every, everyone, every time something falls apart and I would ask the person, okay, why did your relationship fall apart? And they said, okay, well, you know, the person just prioritized their career. Like they weren't willing to, you know, their career was more important than the relationship. So we decided to break up. Okay, totally fine. Um, what happened with the second person? Well, the second person had daddy issues. So, you know, they just like, you know, had daddy issues and it was like a problem. And, and so like, you know, they had to work on themselves before they were ready for a relationship. Completely reasonable. Third relationship. Why did the relationship fall apart? Well, this person had a problem. Like they were, they had, they were an alcoholic and like the drinking was just super out of control. And so like, you know, that's the reason the relationship fell apart. And what's the fourth reason the relationship fell apart? Well, I, I don't know. Like we just kind of drifted apart. Um, you know, they got kind of busy with work. I kind of got busy with work and things just kind of drifted apart. And so you can look at a situation and you can like really say that, you know, you can answer with confidence, but at some point, like you don't actually know if any of those things are correct. And so at some point, you know, what I, what I do with that person is to, you know, ask them like, well, okay, like, what do you think your contribution is? Right. Because there's a common denominator here. 
there's like a common denominator of like, well, maybe like you're actually the problem and it's not any one of those things. And so this absolutely applies in Dota and in real life where like a lot of times, you know, people will believe they understand why things happen, why you can't get a job, why you're, you know, you're lazy, why you self-sabotage, why you're forever alone, why you get passed over for promotions, um, why you wind up with like, you know, friends who don't respect your boundaries. There are all kinds of things. And you can say like, oh, this person doesn't respect my boundaries. My in-laws are a pain in the ass. You can attribute reasons to all kinds of things in life because that's what our brain is designed to do. Our brain is designed to formulate patterns from uncertainty. Like that's like the biggest goal of the brain, right? It's, it's how we are able to tell that clouds lead to rain because our brain is really good at associating co uh, cor uh, taking correlation and attributing causation from correlations. So, for example, in this is how people will even come up with little rituals, right? Like, I have my lucky underwear. Well, like, what's up with that? It's just, I don't know. Like, my lucky underwear, like, I, the reason I failed the test is because I didn't have the lucky underwear, right? So there's all kinds of things. That's what our brain does, is it tries to take, it tries to make sense of chaos. The problem is that oftentimes it doesn't do it correctly. Oftentimes it does do it correctly, right? Because we are pretty good. We, as human beings, figure things out. We've sent people into space. You know, we figured out how to develop a vaccine against COVID. Um, I figured out how to adjust camera and things like that. And, and, you know, I figured things out relating to stream. And, and so it's really tricky, but like in Dota, hindsight is not 2020. And for those of you like who really think you figured everything out in your life, I'd strongly encourage you to question your hindsight as well, because chances are your hindsight really isn't 2020. If you really think about it objectively, there's no right answer to why you you and someone else managed to break up, right? There's no like there's no like actual objective answer. There's just opinion. But that's not what our brain tries to tell us. Because the truth is that, you know, in a game of Dota, there are so many factors that go into it and you never really know. Which is the other reason that I respect these guys a lot, because like in the face of never really knowing, you have to develop confidence and like transmit that confidence to your team and try to play this game that you will never know if you are adequately prepared for, right? So you, you prep the draft and you kind of think about what you're going to play and you practice and you scrim and all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, you never know whether you're actually going to like succeed or not. And this is really different from most other dimensions of life because like, you know, for example, for a test, like if you study enough, right? And assuming that you have some, you know, basic level of IQ and you can handle the coursework and things like that. You can basically work your way to getting an A. Like the A is there if you work hard enough, right? Maybe you've got ADHD and that needs to be treated and things like that. But generally speaking, you can work your way to an A. Generally speaking in life, like you can work your way to a particular goal. Like if you try hard enough, I think most people will end up in a relationship if that's what they want, right? Like you can try really hard and you can work on a bunch of things and you can get there. In Dota, like I don't know that you can ever get there. Because at the end of the day, like there's someone on the other side of the table who could be working just as hard as you are. And so even though you put in all this work, like it could be luck, it could be RNG, it could be that they had a better idea than you did. It could be that their ideas happen to align with the current meta. So even though your ideas are superior, that like the meta favors their ideas over your ideas. Um, you can certainly also argue that you know, the good teams are the ones that adapt their ideas to the meta and, and things like that. So that, like the point is that you can make a point and counterpoint for any given thing. And like you can, and you'll never know what the right answer is. So it, it's just incredibly complex. And the, the really shocking thing is that you don't ever have like a, a real answer to base things on. Right. So like even in, in the rest of life, like we'll have like if you're at your job, you have a performance review where people will sit down and will tell you, hey, we think you need to like work on A, B and C. And they may not be 100 percent correct, but like there's nothing like that in Dota. Right. It's not like, you know, LGD a team spirit is going to sit down with LGD after the tournament. And they're going to be like, hey, here's the reason we think you lost. We think you need to work on like A, B and C. Like professional teams are not going to give each other like feedback to help them improve. So it's like, how the hell do you improve? How the hell do you know what works and what doesn't work? It's just, it's just a mind numbing amount of like uncertainty and poor quality information. It blows my mind. 
And so th- then also, like, if we talk about, you know, now there's the TI shuffle season, right? So everyone's like rumoring about what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. By the way, I know a lot about what's going to happen, but I can't say. Um, so, you know, do you kick a particular player? That's another great example of like, uh, you never know, right? You never know, like, so like, let's say you have a poor performance at TI. Do you replace someone or do you not replace someone? Is that person the reason that you lost? <laughs> okay. Uh, is that person the reason that you lost? You, you never know, right? Like, so you can kick someone and you can replace. I have theories about why people get kicked and why teams are successful. <laughs> There's so much I've learned to chat. Um, but it's, it's like challenging, right? So like, just think about that question. Like, how do you know that kicking someone is going to lead to success? You don't. How do you know that that person was really the problem? You actually don't. Like you can assess and you can make a judgment, right? But you never really know. <laughs> I actually don't know what EG is going to do. I know about other teams. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, so let me just share with you guys like something that I did sort of notice. So here's an example of like what's hard about Dota. So I'm going to talk for a second about doubt and confidence and regression. So if we kind of think about... Um, so I, I kind of have a hypothesis as to why teams consistently underperform. Okay. So like what tends to happen is like, you know, at some point in the tournament, you're going to start to doubt your strategies unless you just dominate everyone, which is generally speaking, not going to happen. And even if you, if you do, you know, win games, like sometimes there are games that you win where you're filled with doubt and other games that you win that you're, you know, other games that you lose where you're actually not doubting at all. So that's the other really interesting thing is that like, you know, you can win a game and you can be like, we really had no idea what we were doing and they just threw. So does that mean that your strategy is good or like... Or what, you know. Um, but I, I think that one of the things that's important to remember is that when people doubt, uh, so I'll just share with you guys like one example of something that I kind of noticed from like understanding psychology and the human mind. So generally speaking, what what will happen is people will, um, you know, people will develop a game plan as a team, right? And so we're going to say like, okay, this is what our game plan is. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And then as the game starts to fall apart, or as people begin to doubt and you, cause you have to, sometimes you have to adapt too, right? So if your game plan isn't working, that's also tricky. Like there's times where doubting your game plan is like really important because doubt and adaptation kind of go hand in hand. So the, the person who never doubts will never adapt because if I'm, I'm sure I'm right, then like, there's no reason to change what I'm doing. And so then you're dooming yourself to a life without adaptation. So that, that's kind of interesting because people sort of think a little bit about like, you know, confidence is like really good, but it's been my experience that actually doubting is actually super healthy as well. And then what happens when we sort of get into a period of doubt is I notice that a lot of teams will actually regress. And what I mean by regress is that you have to remember that these players have played Dota for like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 hours, and they've developed their own particular style. And as a team, you can put together, you know, a game plan, but as the game plan starts to fall apart, and you can't stick to that game plan, what tends to happen is that players will sort of regress back to what they know. So they'll sort of go to like defaulting to like their particular play style, and they won't necessarily play as a team anymore. And so this is also something that we kind of see in relationships, for example. So generally speaking, when relationships are under a period of stress, what will happen is like the people in the relationship will regress to their own style of like how they manage conflict, right? So we may be able to communicate healthily while everything is going well, but when there's stress under the relationship, I'm going to regress. And what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to shut down. Whereas my partner may turn to, you know, talking to their mom all the time about like complaining about the relationship. So whereas I may sort of withdraw into myself, like my partner, partner may do something else. And so then we start, sort of start to get on different pages once the initial game plan or once like things start to fall apart and there's a period of stress. And so I think one of the things that I see a lot in teams is that, you know, sometimes they'll play coordinated, but I, I think what, what sort of happens is as things don't go their way, 
the way, if you have to adapt on the fly, the way in which you adapt is based on your own experience and what you've trained. And so what can happen in an individual game of Dota is you can have five people adapting in their own way. And so when they start to adapt in their own way, because they're not all thinking exactly the same, because once again, they're not open AI, they start to become uncoordinated. And so working on these kinds of things is a lot of like what I was kind of doing, um, right? So helping people like coordinate, communicate, helping people recognize some of these kinds of things. I think it's just an interesting like example of, um, you know, how complex esports actually is. Anyway. I'm kind of all over the place today, just sharing thoughts. I don't know, do people not have 40,000 hours in Dota? Do pros not have that? Well, so some people are saying Dr. K equals best coach. So that that's, so there's... Two ways to look at that, right? One way to look at that is that EG had a good season. The other way to look at that is EG placed 9th to 12th at TI. So what do y'all think? Is it Dr. K or Dr. Keck W? <laughs> Could be either one, right? It depends on your standard of judgment. What what is this uh what is this man? The Keck W that's the that's the Spanish dude, right? <laughs> El Lucitas. That's the guy who's like Itu Itu That's this guy, right? Yeah, that guy's great. <clears throat> okay. So next thing that I want to do is I'm going to share with you all just a couple of takeaways. So here's what I'd say is like some of the most important stuff that I learned from uh, being at TI. So the first kind of takeaway is that really like the only choice you truly have in life is to move forward or not move forward. So as I just kind of said, you know, you never really know why you may have won or why you may have lost, right? You you get disappointed. You don't really know, like maybe the job market is bad. Maybe, you know, she's just not that into you. Maybe he's still getting out of a relationship. You never really know why things don't go in your favor. You can hypothesize and by all means you should hypothesize. It's healthy to hypothesize so that you can adapt, you know, work on yourself, etc. But at the end of the day, you never really know what you did wrong or what you did right. There's no perfect source of information. So if you guys have setbacks in life, I think the first thing to understand is it's not about necessarily figuring out the right answer. It's about deciding, to deciding am I going to try again or not try again? And it's, it's certainly my, you know, it's been my experience. And I thought about this a lot, too, where people were sort of asking me, like, you know, I remember Kruthi was sort of asking me, do you think it was like worth your time to go? And I think it was absolutely worth my time. I mean, would it, have been nice, would it have been nice if EG won TI? Like, absolutely. Would that have made me happy? But I don't think that the experience was a failure just because EG didn't win TI. I think there's a lot to learn from, you know, I mean, I learned so much. Like, like it's just, I'm, I haven't been this clueless about something and learned so much in, a, in many, many years. So it was one of the most educational experiences of my life. And I think the first and only real question is like, do you move forward? Like, yeah or nay? Um, the second thing to understand is that in life, despite all of your best efforts, winning is not guaranteed. And I know it's, it's kind of interesting, but like, we don't really view it that way, right? Like, I think at the end of the day, you can try your best. You can try to get in shape. You can clean up your wardrobe. You can get a nice haircut. You can have a makeover and you can ask out your crush and they may still say no. So you can, and, and you don't have to be participating in TI to understand this, right? Any game of Dota, you can show up in any game of Dota, a pub game, um, you know, a TI tournament game. And like, you can be, you can give it everything you've got. It doesn't matter. Like you can give it everything you've got and you may not win. So the one, one of the hardest things about life is that no matter how much effort you put in, you are never guaranteed to be successful. <clears throat> so that's 
So the next thing is that speaking about, you know, how to be successful is I want you all to understand that, like, even though you can never guarantee success, there are very, very concrete things you can do to improve your chances of success. And this is sort of the attitude that I advocate in life is that you may not be able to get someone to fall in love with you, but you can absolutely do a lot of things to increase your chances. And so I think a lot of times what happens is we get emotionally caught up in a particular result, right? So like, for example, not winning TI. And that result can be so devastating that it actually like shatters us and we feel like not moving forward. We feel like practicing is a waste of time. We feel like, you know, we never really know. Like I, I'm saying, you, hindsight isn't 2020. So what's the point in trying? Despair can set in. All kinds of like bad stuff can happen. But at the end of the day, I think the success, the formula for success is about working on what you can work work on and increasing the probability of success as much as you can. Even though you may not ever be able to hit 100% chance of success, there are very concrete things that you can do to improve, right? So if we look at something like Dota, let's forget about professional players, but like myself, like I'm a 2K player, there are things that I can improve. And so I can look at a, a particular game of Dota and I can say there's no way I could have won that game and that could have been absolutely true. But you have to be able to hold the dialectic, which means hold kind of contrary things at the same time, which is that it, it was impossible for me to win this game. And at the same time, there are a lot of things I could do to get better. And so if you guys are feeling stuck in life and you don't really like, you know, even though you may never be able to get to 100% chance of success, it doesn't mean that you are powerless in the face of your circumstances. There are absolutely things that you can improve. Right. So if you're stuck, uh, you know, like I, I'll just share, like, you know, I, I applied to medical school 120 times. And even though I got rejected 120 times, like each time I got rejected, it was three application cycles. So really three times, like I applied 40 to 40 medical schools. And, you know, each time I, I applied for the application cycle the next year, like I can work on that application, I can improve it and I can try to apply again. So I think if you want to be successful in life, you know, even though it's kind of bizarre, but don't shoot for a guaranteed success. Just try to increase your odds of success as much as possible. And this is kind of the, the last thing that I sort of learned is that it's really important to stay detached. And I, I know that this is a big philosophy that we have at Healthy Gamer, right? So we, we kind of advocate for devoting yourself to your actions and being detached from the outcomes of your actions. And what I mean by that is that like, you know, you can the most you can never win a game of Dota. All you can do is play a game of Dota to the best of your ability. And if you lose that game of Dota, all you can do is try to learn from that from the best of your ability. So you can watch replays, you can practice last hitting, you can think about item builds, you can talk to other people about it. You can try to improve your odds of success. And then the second game that you go into, you're still not guaranteed success, right? There's there's nothing you can do to guarantee that you will win a particular game of Dota. And so this is something that's really, really hard to do in Dota and in life. But I think that this is where, like, you know, I'll share this, but, like, I know it's kind of weird, but, you know, Dota is the same game. Whether you're playing it in a pub, whether I'm playing it or Arteezy's playing it or, you know, Ame's playing it or Collapse is playing it, it's the same game. The heroes are the same, the items are the same, the timings are the same, Runes spawn every two minutes, bounty runes spawn every three minutes. The game is exactly the same, whether you're playing a pub or you're playing in the grand finals of TI. It's exactly the same. So what is it that makes your ability to play it so different, right? What is the difference between a pub and being in the grand finals at TI? It's all up here. And so this is the big thing that I think a lot of people miss is that most of life is just what it is. But your ability to succeed at life or crack under the pressure all comes from here, right? Because what is the pressure? The game is exactly the same, right? Like last hitting mechanics are exactly the same. Like the patches, you know, for the duration of this TI is exactly the same. The items are the same. Everything's the same. And in life, like what we do on a daily basis is sort of exactly the same. You have to wake up. You have to decide, okay, am I going to, am I going to study today or not study today or, you know, it's all the same. Where the pressure comes from, where the confusion comes from, where the doubt comes from, and where the confidence comes from is all up here. And too often in life, when something doesn't go our way, what we try to do is find some external thing to blame, right? Like, oh, like, 
you know, the reason I don't get a, I didn't get promoted is because of like politics at the workplace. And you can sort of say something like that and you can say, okay, like, so GG, I'm done. But then like, you know, there's, first of all, that may not even be true. You may be attributing a lack of poor performance to politics in the workplace. Maybe you just are not as good at your job as someone else's. And maybe you call that politics. Or the other way, the other thing to th think about is if it's politics at the workplace, why can't you learn politics at the workplace? Why can't you learn how to be a political animal at the workplace? So the, the key thing is that, you know, the game of life tends to be pretty consistent. The game of Dota tends to be pretty consistent. The big difference in terms of whether you succeed or fail has to do with the player, right? It has to do the, with the mindset of the player. It has to do with the person who, you're the player of your life. So the question is, what's going on up here? Because this is what you need to work on. Because generally speaking, like the rules of life are like, like kind of the same, right? You can work on your resume, you can apply for a job, you can get in shape, you can do all those things. It's just how you play the game. So it's all it all kind of comes down to you. So overall, it's been fantastic. Um, you know, it was an amazing opportunity to be able to go to TI. I'm honestly like honored and... Um, you know, I, I said as much to all the players, like, you know, the day after they got knocked out of the tournament, like I was kind of telling them, kind of tearing up a little bit that it's been amazing to like work with them over the last year. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Like I'm proud of them. Um, I'm proud of what they've accomplished. Like I understand that it's okay to be disappointed, but just personally, like it's been an amazing opportunity. And I'm so grateful because as someone who has been playing Dota since it was a Warcraft 3 mod, the ability to go to actual, like, go to TI was amazing in and of itself this year uh, because of COVID and all that, right? So I was, like, super lucky there. And to actually be able to sit down and, like, talk to players, right? So, like, I've been watching RTZ stream for years. And to be able to sit down and, like, have lunch with him, it's, like, it's amazing. Um, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky that I was able to be a part of their journey, even if it is a little bit disappointing. You know, it doesn't, I don't, I don't view the value of my life or my time based on the results of what happens. So sometimes people would even ask me, they'd ask like, you know, are you like disappointed, right? Like, are you disappointed in like how the tournament went and stuff like that? And, and no, I'm, I'm not right. Cause I, I think, or I mean, like I'm somewhat, I'm not disappointed in, in, in the team. The result is disappointing, but that's just life, right? Like you can't tie yourself to your results. You have to focus on like the people involved and the effort that you put in and what comes next. That's the real test. And so, you know, I, I feel like this is a, what I'm about to say is a little bit idiotic. I was going to say that, you know, the real test comes after you lose TI. Because I think that's really what, what makes us who we are in life. It's not about how we win. It's about how we lose. Right. So if you, if you think about, you know, people who I respect they're not the ones who had it really easy, had a 90% chance of success, and then like ended up getting the promotion. It's the person who failed once and then picks themselves up off the mat and tries to do better and decides to apply again. And so I think this is something that, that I encourage all y'all to take to heart too. And I learned, I saw this lesson um, being lived out and hopefully it'll continue to be lived out, which is, you know, in life, you can't control what's going to happen. So the, the only thing that you really have within your power to control as a human being is what you do with the loss. And like I said earlier, you know, TI is a tournament where there are five winners and 85 losers. It's like literally how it's designed. It's designed for the vast majority of people to be losers. And unfortunately in life, I think this is also true that most people are the losers. The winners are few and far between. There, there are very few of us, I mean, and I, you know, who really have the opportunity for success are lucky enough to succeed. Um, sure, is there hard work? But like, you know, if you, if I think about myself, it's like, did I work hard? Yeah. Some people will say like, oh, you know, you deserve your success. I don't know that any, I, I don't know that I do deserve my success because it's not like I work any harder than, let's say, a single mother of two who's like working two and a half jobs. Right. I remember having patients like that who work actually way harder than I do. Um, you know, they, they try so hard. They're like in a single parent household, do so much for their kids, work super hard, 
sacrifice all of their like personal time for the benefit of their children. And why do I deserve more than that person? I don't. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think in life, you know, you don't necessarily get what you deserve. And I don't know what determines what you deserve. Um, but I, all I know is that, you know, what you're worth and what I respect people for is how you manage what you're given, whether that's a win or a loss, whether you're gracious as a winner and you try to support other people if you're one of the lucky ones, or as a loser, whether you pick yourself up off the mat and decide to try again. So at the end of the day, I'd say focus on your actions and focus on yourselves. And it's okay to be a loser. The truth is that the vast majority of people on the planet are like losers, right? The number of people who are in poverty far outweighs the number of people who have ultra high net worth. Wealth inequality is getting worse. That's just life. So that's the that's the the life that we've you know that's the hand that we've been dealt in life and the, the goal is to try to do what you can with it. Questions. <laughs> so that's <laughs> Will you be attending the next TI? Bro, I attended this TI. The team that I, I worked with got 9th to 12th. Will, will I be attending the next TI? Let's start by asking the team <laughs> whether they want me there. <laughs> you guys are making it sound like I've got an invitation. Uh, so I, I, I'm kind of trolling. So my relationship with EG is fantastic. As far as I can tell anyway. So I, I think we got to be really close and it was really awesome. I really loved going. Really loved it, getting to know them. I think irrespective of whether I go to TI or don't go to TI or, you know, whatever happens, I, I think hopefully we'll be friends for, you know, a long time. <laughs> I, I, I love the players, like just as people. They're just such amazing individuals each and every one of them. You know, they each have their own particular style and, and like manner, um, but they're all fantastic. So someone's asking, do you think RTZ will ever win a TI? And then I see the next uh, question. The question right after it is, how do you focus on the process? So you focus on the process by not asking that question. Right? So I have no idea if RTZ will ever win a TI. Statistically, most professional Dota players will never win a TI. But here's what I'd say. Your chances of winning TI are a lot greater the more that you accept that it's just a game of Dota. And so one thing that I really loved was uh, TS's... If you guys like listen to their coach, I think the attitude that they had for Game 5 was perfect. So someone asked him, what's your strategy? And he's like, my strategy is luck. Our strategy is luck. And that's honestly like when I heard that, I, I was watching the game with some people and I was like, I think these guys are going to win. Like it's, it's an acknowledgement that there's only so much you can do, right? That there's no strategy that's going to guarantee you success. It's just you show up and you play the best goddamn Dota of your life and you hope that Gaben is on your side. That's the ultimate strategy to win TI. I'm not kidding. Like, that's why what I was, you know, what I explained to people is like, you know, I know it sounds bizarre, but the game of Dota is exactly the same, whether you're playing a pub or game five of the grand finals. It's the same damn game. It's just getting psyched out in your head because it's game five of, of TI grand finals. That's what, that's what screws you over. Uh, so people are asking specifics about EG. I'm not going to comment specifically on players and like what's going on. So I think that like all of my other clients, so the relationship is public, obviously, but um, I think they're all they're all entitled to privacy. So I'm not going to answer any specific questions about the players. I apologize. I'm happy to share my experience. Well, working with Bulb is great, dude. Working with all the players was a lot of fun. Um, 
Yeah, I've talked to a lot of other teams. I've worked with more teams than EG, in a manner of speaking. Um, <coughs> uh, so just a little bit about Romania. So I know that, like, I mean, we probably jumped on this this bandwagon a little bit, too. So, like, we sent out some pictures of, like, you know, the quarantine food and stuff like that. So here's what I'd say. I think Valve gets a lot of crap, right? They said, like, Valve should do this and Valve should do that. And I think PGL also, like, got some crap. I think y'all have to understand. So, I, I, I mean, I think this is, once again, the internet being judgmental. Like, organizing a tournament during COVID is not easy. There are so many things that go into, like, organizing a major esports event. Um, I mean, it's hard. Like, there's, like, visas and flights and, like, daily COVID tests. They did a lot of stuff that I think that was actually really cool. So they gave us these little Bluetooth trackers that sort of track which people you're around so that if one person tests positive, they know who that person has been exposed to uh, because they know based on your Bluetooth data. So it does. it's not like a GPS tracker that it like tracks your location. It just knows like, okay, which tracker has had contact with like which other trackers. And so it, it's, I think that it's like, you know, like it's very, very hard to organize a tournament of this magnitude in these kinds of circumstances. So even there were, there were some things that, you know, I, I certainly think the tournament could have done better or Valve could have done better. I mean, obviously there's room for improvement all the time. I, I think it's important to remember that like pulling it off is not easy to do. Like, sure, there are problems, but just the fact that the tournament even happened, that we had a TI this year, right? Because like Sweden basically was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. And then Valve is like, what do you do if you're Valve? You know, it's tough. It's really tough. How do you organize something on such short notice? Like all the country, like the country governments are like concerned about COVID. Players are coming from all over the world. You know, different countries have different levels of like COVID restrictions. So, you know, can you hold TI in a country? And like, what if that country decides like, oh, by the way, we're not going to allow anyone from, you know, Malaysia. Then what? Like, how do you manage all that? It's so hard. Um, student Florida. Yeah. I'm just reading questions. Uh, so uh, I, if you guys, I, I thought the Seb and No-Tail casts were excellent. If you guys didn't see those, like, I, I think really listening to their view, I think they shared a lot of information. So I'm not sure. I think Seb said he was retiring, right? Is he? I don't know. But yeah, the draft panel was brilliant. I also think... Um, uh, so did I get some dope TI merch? I did get some TI merch. It was really nice. And I was also a little bit disappointed because of all the COVID restrictions. So the people who were going to bring all the merch like couldn't come. So the other neat thing, technically, chat, <laughs> technically... So, okay, there's one story I can tell you guys, okay? So when we first got to TI, when we got to Romania, um, it turned out that IG and Aster had players who had gotten COVID. So, you know, like, I was kind of asking people, I, I was talking to Fly. And so I was like, you know, Fly, wow. So like, that's crazy that, you know, these people, you know, people got COVID and stuff. What, you know, uh, what happens if one of y'all gets COVID? Like, do you guys play with a stand-in or what? And he's like, no, no, no. Like, there aren't stand-ins. Like, you, the, the tournament rules are such that um, you can't play. Like, you can't, like, pull another player from a different team or something like that. So I, I, I kind of asked him, you know, if a team gets eliminated and you guys, like, if someone gets COVID, like, mid-tournament, can you, like, pull someone from a different team? And he's like, no. And he's like, the, the stand-ins have to be from your pod of eight. So each team gets eight people. And so he's like, and so he was like, you know, if we get one, if one person gets COVID, then Bulba's going to have to play. If another person gets COVID, then Wilson's going to be second stand in. And then if three people on the team get to COVID, it looks like it's going to be Dr. K playing. 
And I got to say, that is the scariest moment in my life. Like, I've been with a lot of scary moments. And I was like, Tal, you're joking, right? And he's like, no, I'm not joking. He's like, if we three people get sick, like, you're going to have to play at TI. I was like, oh, my God. And, and so I was so terrified. I was like, oh, my God. That's that's so scary, dude. But technically, technically, I was on a team at TI. I was the third stand-in for Evil Geniuses. <coughs> 2K. 2K MMR, boys. I just got to say, I'm glad I, I was like, man, I'm glad I streamed Dota like a few weeks ago. Because I actually played a little bit of Dota. <clears throat> Probably lowest lowest MMR to ever participate at TI. I mean, I, I imagine there may have been people there from other teams who had lower MMR than I did, but maybe not. Maybe the pod was all because, like, some people had like videographers and stuff, and it's possible they've never even played a game of Dota. Someone's asking me which champion would I play. Are we talking about LOL? Yeah, I hear uh, Train is like close, like he's like homies with a lot of these people. Yeah, <clears throat> so a lot of people are asking, am I going to do it again? So I was memeing earlier, but you know, the short answer is I don't know. Um, so I, I think one of the things that does concern me a little bit is that, you know, I was there. So, uh, you know, the yearly commitment wasn't that bad in terms of time, but I, I do think it. I sometimes think a little bit about like what I'm here for, you know, like what, what is my purpose on the earth and as personally gratifying and as hype as it is for me to, um, coach a team at TI for like mental stuff and performance. I do wonder a little bit about what the cost is to y'all. Uh, you know, we started healthy gamer ultimately to help y'all. And even though it's great for me, um, and a lot of fun and very educational, you know, we miss three weeks of streams. Um, I wonder, you know, sometimes we'll get posts on, on the subreddit about, you know, people saying like, oh, like Healthy Gamers helped me a lot. Uh, one of my favorite ones is Dr. K has ruined my life. I don't know if you guys saw this post a while back, but some somebody was like, Dr. K has ruined my life. I used to wake up every day and like play games all day and then like go to bed angry and sad at myself. And then now I wake up and I exercise and I do yoga and I go for a run and I like try to eat healthy and not every everything isn't perfect yet, but I'm it's ruined my old life. And so I, I think a little bit about, you know, what what did people what could I have done with that time in, instead? So I, I did have an amazing opportunity to try to help six people in an organization um, you know, do the best that they possibly could at an at an event that's very important for their lives. I don't I'm glad for the opportunity. I'm grateful. But I do sometimes wonder, you know, if I, because one of the pieces of feedback that I got is that, so I, I joined at the end of the boot camp, and some people felt like, you know, I should have come at the beginning to really be very effective. And so if we're, you know, if, if the boot camp, so could I take five weeks off? Like, I don't know. Right? I don't know. So the, I, I just worry a little bit about that kind of stuff. And really, what's my, so I think what it comes down to is dharma. What's my dharma in this case? Is it to help EG to try to win TI next year, or is it to help y'all? Can I do both? Can you guys get help elsewhere? <laughs> Which is part of the reason, by the way, that we started the coaching program, because like, you know, that way at least HG stuff was ongoing. People continued to be. So I, I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have even done this if we didn't have a coaching program, because I, I sort of, because at the end of the day, people are still, the coaches are still helping people, right? <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, but Dr. K, doesn't your mental health matter? Don't you get to need to live your life? We get help the other 49 weeks of the year. Yeah, so I do. I mean, I do live my life, right? I'm not like streaming and working 100 hours a week. So I do take care of myself. The sentiment is really nice. I appreciate it. But the other thing that I, I frankly have to say is that in a sense, not really. 
So I do live my life, but I think that like I had my 20s to dick around and play video games. That was in my mind, my time to, you know, for myself. And um, then I had the opportunity to like train at a couple of amazing institutions. And so I don't know. I mean, I think also getting COVID earlier this year, <clears throat> you know, life is short. You never know how long you're going to be around. So I kind of feel like now is my time to to give back to the world because I've gotten a lot from it. So I, I do sort of feel somewhat of a crunch in terms of trying to do as much as I can as quickly as I can. Because I really don't know. I mean, who knows what, what's going to happen, right? There's so much uncertainty in the world. And the other thing to think a little bit about, the other thing that kind of bothers me is <clears throat> the understanding that you could say that, okay, like I have many years to help people. But one of the things, part of the reason we started Healthy Gamer, so I'll tell you guys just a quick story. So when I was finishing up training, I got a couple of very good job offers and awesome, awesome people, awesome places to work um, and people who were very supportive. And they said, you know, like, hey, like if you want to be like the expert in video game addiction, like we'll help you. We'll help you start a rehab. So like create like a rehab center for video game addiction where people can come and like, you know, you can help people like your way. Like we think the work that you're doing is awesome. We want to support you in doing it and we'll make it happen. And, but the, the path to that was long. So it was sort of like a 10 year plan of like doing research and really understanding what was effective and what isn't effective. And then, you know, scoping out a site and things like that. And so part of the reason that I turned that down is like, what worried me is that in the 10 years that it takes to open the door to the rehab, what happens to like all of the people? Like, sure, like once, let's say it's probably, well, probably wouldn't have been 10 years, let's say like five years or three years or whatever. So like, let's say four years from the start of that job offer, like we open the doors and we help like 30 people a month. What happens to all the people who need help in the four years prior to opening the doors? And so I think the tricky thing there is that what concerns me about taking kind of time off from healthy gamers work is, I, I mean, I, I imagine y'all understand this, but like there are real consequences, right? If I take a year off and pick this up again, like I see, we see this a lot in our coaching program where, you know, people are like on academic probation, like they're the way that, you know, I remember hearing a case a couple of weeks ago where someone was like, um, is on a visa from a four, like is on a student visa. And so if they fail like one more semester, like their, like their future is closed off. Like they get kicked out of school since they're no longer in school. They don't get to stay in the country that they're in and they have to like move back home and they have like no job prospects. Their family has taken out a lot of loans so that they can come to the U.S. I think it was the U.S. to study. And so what happens to those people? So there are real consequences to not doing things quickly enough. Um, you know, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, people's lives are being made or ruined every week. And so I think our first commitment is to y'all. <clears throat> it's tough. And so once again, I don't know that we can necessarily help that person. I don't know that we can guarantee that that person is not going to, you know, do poorly on their tests and stuff. Like who knows, but we're here to try to help. And our, I think our first responsibility, our primary dharma is to y'all. And the esports stuff is great. I think there's going to be a lot of good stuff that comes out of it, for sure. Um, I think, like I said, I learned a lot. I have, like, pages and pages and pages of notes and things like that. <clears throat> we'll probably uh, put together some more concrete lectures for y'all in terms of, like, key takeaways from what I learned. You know, you can say whatever you want to about the TI performance. But at the end of the day, EG is a top-tier esports organization. And just their, just how they work is like quite remarkable. Like they are just amazing workers. You know, they think a lot, they plan a lot, they communicate a lot, they practice a lot. Um, and so I, I think that there's a lot to be learned and a lot that you can kind of like apply from the way that they approach Dota to your own life. 